When we are born, we have very large empty brains. And those brains are very good at doing two things, particularly two things. It does a lot of things, but there are two things that are key to survival that worked really well in the prehistoric times, but you're going to find that they are actually working against each other in modern civilization. And those two things are the fight or flight mechanism, which is like, oh my god, ugh, dinosaur going to eat us, we must run, and you run. Or it's like, oh, ugh, me hungry, dinosaur look bad, but let's kill that sucker. So that's fight or flight, right? And then the other thing is, well, this ability to everyone's brain, not just you know your sister with the candy cane socks, the one, creative one in the family, but all of us, have this tremendous ability to make connections between disparate pieces of information in our brain, in the database that is our brain. And it's this ability to make connections between ra random things that allows us to solve problems effectively. It's like, ooh, me tired, me, me freezing. We must invent fire because shivering in cave, no working. And so we, we basically start making connections between this, this knowledge. And it's, it's, it's a great thing. It's what we call creative thinking, creativity. Uh, this ability to generate new ideas. And so all of us do have this. We're born with the ability to think of new ideas. So when we're toddlers, we become these fearless explorers of our environment because our job is to look around at all the stuff that's going on. We don't, we're new here. We don't know anything. So we start gathering information. And the parents put everything up really high because you're going to break it, eat it, throw it, or do something you shouldn't be doing with that object. And you're basically breaking the rules. And everybody says, well, that's OK, because it's a toddler. They don't know the rules yet. Once they learn the rules, they will become what's called enculturated. They have learned the rules of society, and they know how to behave themselves. These toddlers have this in, insatiable curiosity about their world, and that allows them to start filling those databases with knowledge for the, with the likelihood that you'll be able to make many, many more connections than you know, for generating better solutions. It's kind of like the analogy would be uh, a person who has no curiosity is someone who sits in their office all by themselves shoving, shoving paper around versus the person who gets out and meets everybody in the company and the company needs a corporate-wide problem solved. You want me, not the person sitting alone in the office with almost no knowledge of what's going on in this place. One day that toddler is sitting in preschool, filling up their database, just experiencing life. They're just doing things for the pure pleasure and reward of experience and exploration, fearlessly. And then one day, they're sitting there, and they're drawing their dog, just trying to, just absorbing the moment. And it's just wonderful, the pen scratching on the paper. And they're learning from this. They're understanding this. They're learning how to understand things. And the kid next to him leans over, leans over and says, you know what? Your dog stinks. Mine's better. And the toddler just reels like they've been stung and just says, oh, wait a minute, what? I mean, they've just suffered judgment and criticism, the sting of judgment. And they look over and they see the other dog and it's like, oh my god, his dog is better than mine. And so that in, in, initiates, that turns on the fear and flight mechanism that's in us. And we recoil and vow never to draw again because bad things happen. And they become one of the millions and billions of people on earth who say the words, I can't even draw stick figures. So we start to get this feeling that life can sting. Going into K-12, it just gets worse. 98% of these kindergarten kids in one study test very high for the capacity to generate new ideas, for creative capacity, for making connections in the brain. So for example, your parents, your parents are wonderful. They love you. They want you to not be arrested. They want, every, they, they do, they want everything for you. They want the American dream. They want their definition of success. They want you to make a lot of money. They want you to have the white picket fence. They want you to get married and have, give them grandchildren. They want you to, to, uh, to, to succeed in your chosen field that they helped you choose because they said you really shouldn't be an artist. You should be one of these engineers because they're the ones that have more guaranteed jobs and they can pay off your student loans. So this whole thing, everything, great hobby. Oh my God, but, but let's focus over here. This, you know what? I'll go a step further. This is all I'll pay for is a nursing program, you know, nursing degree or something like this when you want to be a painter, right? Parents, they do it because they love you. Parents aren't evil. They want the best for you. But we, we get this a lot from peers and from our religion. So your peers are like, you know, you can't wear those shoes. You cannot talk to that guy. You cannot, you cannot say this. You cannot believe this. You cannot, you cannot do this. This is not what we, we're cool. So whatever the peer group is, whatever that tribe is, you conform to their rules. 
with religion, I was, I've been born again, I've been Catholic, I'm an atheist now, I've been all over the place in search of something. But religions basically say, you have free will, and this is all religions, you have free will, but in this area over here, this is how you must think, and it's non-negotiable. But the problem is that it starts to kill your curiosity. So it's like little parts of your heart muscle that just start to die, because no longer curious about that. No need to, we've told you how to think. So curiosity starts to wane throughout your K-12 years. It starts to go away. Except in this one little narrow track you've been allowed. Schools are the worst. Schools, K-12 is just crippling in this way because what K-12 does is says, gee, you know, hey, eighth grade young boy or girl student, amazing portrait of the president. Oh my God, oh, such a likeness. But why don't we just set this aside how are your math and science scores? Because that's what's going to get you into college. America does not value that. You've all got to get on this conveyor belt to STEM. And if you don't, you don't go to college. And the problem with that is that it, it puts us all into the same exact mold when we're also wonderfully imperfect and unique. It doesn't celebrate uniqueness at all. It celebrates conformity, and that's the way societies work. It wouldn't be a society if, if everybody did whatever the heck they wanted. You need conformists. But what happens is we become, we lose our, our curiosity. The, the interest in filling that database from being that fearless toddler just starts to shrink and shrivel because we've been told how to think in so many ways that we become the amalgam of everybody else's expectation. We're covered in post-it notes that say who we are and what we can and can't do, mostly from other people. We've lost our sense of who we are, our individuality. And this can be very crippling to our careers and to our lives. And I think about the lost innovation in this country where, where if you were able to celebrate our uniqueness and push people toward doing something they were meant to be doing that they really loved, there would be so much more uh, just good stuff going on in this, in this world. We, we get these messages that we're not okay. I was one of these kids who definitely, uh, I definitely failed. I, fail, I, I, I failed math, science, and English, and I failed and I couldn't get into college. The best art schools I applied to said, great art kid, but you know, your math and science scores just stink and you're not, getting, you're, you're not allowed here. And so I didn't go. And so my, da and my dad, my parents definitely thought I was stupid and I was not allowed to go to college. They would not, not on their dime. Quote, I'm not sending that bum to college. I decided I'm gonna go find my own path. I, always, I was terribly wounded and insecure and I still am, but. I figured out that I am still really curious about where I, my life could lead. The ideas I were having were, were, uh, somehow outweighed all of that, and I became a survivor. I survived the system. And I became very successful in art in New York. I reached the top of my field at Newsweek Magazine. I, I, had a, I got a science grant from the Ni National Science Foundation, and I write for the Huffington Post. So I, I am not a stupid guy. So this is all the bad stuff that I'm telling you. It all sounds really horrible. Like, oh my God, doom and gloom, terrible. We're all horrible, our society sucks. And in many ways it does. But there is really incredibly good news. Buy my product, and no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> there's really good news. And that good news is that there are things you can do at any age, finally, no matter how crippled and wounded you are, because we are creating a, a nation of crippled thinkers and ineffective problem solvers. Because the way we solve problems is we look at what's been done in, the, done in the past and we apply those lessons to the present. And often with the way this world's going, there are problems that are starting to come up and that there is no solution that's done, been done in the past to solve this problem, but that's what we do. And so I teach a class of 500 and the first solution is always, the, everyone in the room has the same exact idea and they're not gonna work. So there are ways to bypass all of that that, that wiring. And the very first thing is going to sound a little groovy, but the very first thing you can and should do is to start working on you. Start peeling off these post-it notes. And what that means is that you have to be more mindful of what you're actually doing and feeling. We, we, we live in the, in the present. We don't live in the future and we don't live in the past. And so it's, it, we do so much to deflect what, what's happening inside of us that we, we don't want to think about it because it's always painful. And so instead of ignoring that pain or deflecting that pain and, and distracting that pain, just sit with yourself and actually think about why you're feeling this, what just caused this feeling. So you need to start becoming more mindful of what's going on inside of you. And most importantly, start being forgiving to yourself. 
You have to start forgiving yourself and recognizing that everyone around you has these horridly powerful expectations and we're our own worst critics. And so you've got to start being kinder, the kindest person in the world to yourself, loving yourself and not judging that you're not perfect. We, we are, the suicide rate has never been this high for young people. They're, they're seeing these perfectly curated lives on all this social media and it's not real. But they think it is and they think they're the only bozo on the bus. And so the more you can think about yourself and start, this sounds so groovy, but start loving yourself and accepting yourself for all your wonderful imperfections because we're all wonderfully imperfect. That's an important thing, starting there. And more practically, if you can start challenging the assumptions that you make about yourself. We all have these things that are called limiting beliefs. You can look up the term limiting beliefs. So if we start recognizing what these beliefs we have about our own capacity that limit our potential for success, it's like we have a ceiling on our potential because of our own thinking about ourselves, not other people's, but our own. Other people have caused this to happen. Other, our society has made us into these crippled and terrified thinkers. But if you, the only way path to getting out of this is to actually take a hard look at this. So when you say, oh, it's, there's, there's no reason why I should even try for my master's, I'm not gonna probably get a better job anyway. You, these, are, these are assumptions you're making about yourself. And they're not true. If you can start ignoring your, that little voice in your head that you don't even know is happening, you will do better. For example, we don't even know that we're living a mediocre life. We don't even know that our lives are pretty much conforming to everyone else's life, that we're just sort of living in mediocrity. And what I mean by that, it's sort of like people still think they're having really good ideas when they're actually not really good ideas. They're just ideas, probably good, based on something exactly that's been done before. Like for example, there's the story of the fish, the two, little, two, the two young fish where the old fish comes by and says, hey boys, how's the water? And the fish go, what's water? Because they don't even see what they're surrounded by. And that's how mediocrity is. And it's, people say that, I've, I read a great quote, it was, I can't recall who said it, but it's not about, it's not that we fear failure, it's that we don't fear mediocrity. That keeps us and holds us back. So you can start working on yourself by challenging these assumptions and being kinder to yourself. The second thing you can do is learn these great, great techniques for bypassing your analytical brain. So actually, there are tricks that, that trick you in the brainstorming set part of life. We are immediately go to solutions in this world. Immediately go to solutions. We immediately just, I, I brought in a guy in a wheelchair into my class of 500 students to sort of help brainstorm the solution this guy was looking for, which was, he, can, he races cars. He's an amazing guy, Michael. He's a car racer, but he only has the use of his arms. And he was saying he would love to find a way to shovel snow in his driveway, just like everybody else, as cheaply as everybody does, as quickly, and in an unmotorized wheelchair. Immediately hands went up in my class. The, we, the first thing we go to is to go to the solution, and that's the way we work in this society. We don't even think about it. All you need to do is just bolt a bulldozer blade onto the front of your chair and you're done. You're welcome. <laughs> and it's like, that's what everybody in the room thought of the, I said, how, you know, how many of you thought about the bulldozer blade? <laughs> it's like, Michael, have you ever thought of a bulldozer blade being bolted onto your chair before? We go right to the solution with, we think are great ideas. We don't even see that it's not a good idea. There are techniques and tricks for bypassing your analytical brain and coming up with more effective solutions. There's something called provocative thinking, which challenges your brain. There's word association, random association. Try to learn these techniques for thinking, bypassing your analytical judgmental brain. The last one is there are processes for solving problems. One of them is design thinking, which was invented by a company called IDEO. And they started the D School at Stanford University, which was for finding solutions using human-centered design. Human-centered design means putting the user first at the beginning of the process. Michael at the beginning of the process. Learn all about Michael's life. Learn about his life, what his limitations, his restrictions, his needs. What is it really like showing empathy for that? Once you understand that, you might start being able to solve his problem about shoveling snow. And so adopting these processes, and if you're a company, learn how to create a culture in your, in, your, in your company that is playful and celebrates individuality and unique, crazy ideas. 
um, what happens is, you know, you want, I've been in a million of these meetings in New York where you walk in, there's a problem going on, like Newsweek is going down in flames and nobody's buying our magazine. And so we walk into the conference boardroom and there's the bottle of water, sharpened pencil, pad of paper, bottle of water, sharpened pencil, pad of paper. And the boss is going to sit at their main seat. Everyone walking into that room is looking for the seat that's least likely to be called on by the boss because no one has an idea in their head of how to solve this problem. It's oppressive. The boss is there. It's a terrible environment. So those three things are things you can do. But first of all, it starts with healing you, healing your wounded soul. And all of us have it, but we're, we're so... You, you don't want to get through this whole very short life we're living, coming out on the other side and still not knowing who you are under all those post-it notes. And it's worth knowing who you are. You love yourself, you're kind to yourself, you're non-judgmental, and that's the goal. You know, to feel like that's how you can really contribute to this society, not by thinking like everybody else. Thanks for having me. <laughs>